Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Ethic Designed, Sealed, and Delivered with Mangala Paranaratan, founder and CEO of Kelsey Technologies, Anarkul Singha, director of the Lankan Angel Network, Him the Jayavira, COO of Sri Lanka Institute of Nanotechnology, and Jivan Nyanam, co founder at Hatch, discussing the do's and the don'ts for founders and investors, including what makes a good investment, the importance of a good relationship, making the right deal, and knowing when to walk away. Without further delay, let's get the show on the road. Good to you, Jeevan. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining. I think we wanted to have this session mainly because I think there are a lot of questions um, that kind of go unanswered when investors and startups come together. And I believe uh, uh, this session is kind of here to um, enable, uh, you know, to, to kind of form some rules around engagement, I guess. Um, and they're not hard rules, they're kind of uh, based on, on, on ethics. There are some gray areas. Um, and I think uh, we're just here to, to discuss, you know, um, some, some, some thoughts. Uh, I thought I'll start with um, a kind of difficult one. Um, and, um, you know, it, this is an open panel discussion. And, and what we want is a lot of startups to ask questions because um, I know they're engaging with investors. I know they're engaging with, um, you know, people that want to to invest in their companies. And and maybe um, um, feel free to put in the chat and ask questions. But the first one that I had was, um, and this is a one that I get frequently, especially for new companies, is um, when an investor comes and says, uh, you know, uh, plays an advisory role, um, you know, um, in a startup what percentage of equity do you think the startup should offer um, the, 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 the advisor to play an advisory role for you know, the first two to three years? Uh, what is ethical? What, what do you think um, a startup should offer? I, I guess, and maybe even discuss some of the scenarios whereby which it might be okay to give them equity or First of all, is it okay to give them equity? Is it not okay? And what percentage, if if okay, um, should you give? And what conditions do you think should be present during that scenario? Uh, it's open to the flow, and and I have some thoughts, but I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear um, what the rest of the panelists have to say about this, and maybe um, we, we can we can take forward. Stephen, when you say advisor, you mean in a financial advisory capacity, coming in and then helping to go out and raise further money with investors or what, when you yeah. mean? I, I think advisory is, you know, spending maybe two, three hours a week um, guiding the startup in whatever capacity, whether it's financials, whether it's business model, whether it's um, this thing, but not being active in the startup. Um, and then maybe we can talk about being active as well. Um, but, you know, just a few hours every week. Um, um, would be the first question. Maybe then we can talk about you know, if they actually put in time. Um, can I give my uh, thoughts? So actually this is already perfectly answered. If you go to Founder Institute, they have a, um, uh, I believe it's called FAST. Uh, I can't remember what it stands for, uh, but it covers the advisors and the stage of the startup. So actually they encourage uh, startups to give uh, equity to the founders based on the, the, the startup stage, they have a table in there. It's, it's, so you, the hard work is already done by them. Uh, so, and then it defines also the involvement of the advisor. So whether it's just, uh, you know, reactive advising in a monthly meeting or you get involved with proactively sort of thing when you're sleeping and waking up and, you know, and when you're not talking to them and then going and proactively advising them and then opening up your contacts uh, and helping them with the growth. So that's kind of the three stages that they've defined. And then the startups are defined in the idea stage, startup stage and growth stage. So, and in the table, so you have this side, the involvement of the advisors, and then perfectly define the amount of equity, the suggested equity uh, for these advisors based on the 
sort of like monthly hours, et cetera. And then there's a template agreement there too. So, I mean, I think uh, if you go there uh, to found institute and go to resources somewhere, there's an agreement and everything. Okay. And there, Anatha, any thoughts? Oh. Um, Jivan, from the perspective of uh, the Lankan Angel Network, um, I think we've always looked at this where ideally, you know, it's anywhere from a five to a maximum of a 15%. And as Mangala mentioned, it really depends on where the startup is in their journey as well. Um, but typically with the Angel Network, we won't do more than the 15 because then you're into a territory that's very difficult for founders that for them to then go out and raise money onward from there becomes more challenging because of the way the cap table has already been structured, you know? So um, I think that's how we've looked at it in the past, typically. The, the tension from an investment point of view is obviously valuation, um, that the amount of money that's needed versus what this valuation, but to be honest, at the early stage, I, I think valuation is a very iffy thing to begin with. Um, in, in terms of, the, you mentioned 15%, Anathe, is that to one um, advisor? Uh, and obviously, uh, then they would have to be like, you know, as Mangala said, um, at the level of opening contacts uh, versus, Mangala, you, what was the first one you said? Um, just playing advisory role, what was the second one? Yeah, so I just managed to open the, I went to their website and downloaded the, the template. So. Yeah. Uh, so they call it standard, strategic, and expert. Um, so the standard is just uh, reactive, you know, advisory. Uh, strategic is kind of uh, you think strategically for them and you know proactively get to know and advise them. The expert is where you, like I said, uh, you you open up your network, which is really valuable for startup. Um, yeah. So, but the, I, I'm, I'm actually with the, the the percentages anarchically suggested. Uh, in my personal opinion, it's just too high. Uh, so, I mean, just for the advice without money. Um, so, I mean, I've done advisories to, to startups and taken equity. Uh, so here, the, the, uh, the, the, the founding institute recommends uh, below 1% or almost everything here. Sorry, so Mangala, my bad. What I was talking about there from the land perspective is putting hard cash down. So it's not advisory in that sense. It's very <laughs> much hard cash. And, uh, you know, when we go all the way up to 15%, it's, as Jeevan was saying, that's everybody in at that particular phase, right? We wouldn't want to say that one, by any means, one person takes 15%. It would kind of be everyone that comes in at that round. Um, and that, you know, what at least from personal experience and what I've seen with other members, this also means that you sit on the boards, you are completely active, your monthly board meetings are really more like strat meetings. So it's very different. Yes, I agree with you. If it's just purely someone who's coming in as an advisor and not putting cash down, then I completely agree that you shouldn't be more than one to 2% probably maximum. Yeah, and, and I think also it's worth thinking, um, advising startups to think about over time so maybe um, you don't want to give the, like say you promise 2% um, over two years, um, you know, you want to, you want to, you want to divvy it up over time and make sure that they're continuing to give you advice. And it's not just a one-time thing, I believe for the startups. Um, and, and, you know, um, you got to make it. And, and if you're doing some kind of advisory, um, you know, based on the investor side, you want to make it as easy for the investor um, you know, you will, you've got to do your homework before you go to them because uh, the most valuable thing to any anyone, especially at a high net worth kind of uh, level, would be their time, right? And you don't want to be wasting their time. Um, so I, 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 I think I kind of agree uh, with your metrics, uh, uh, Mangala. I think definitely 2 to 3% over a period of time um, just for advisory and strategic advisory uh, would, would be, um, you know, something that you can give as an early stage startup. Uh, does that, um, obviously it decreases uh, if you are a later stage startup, right? Um, or? Correct. Correct. Um, any numbers around if you're a later stage startup, like from, from the founder's institute? 
So what they have for the expert, the third level uh, advice, so if you're idea stage, they suggest 1%. Uh, the startup stage, second stage is 0.8%. Uh, growth stage, 0.6%. 0.6%, okay. Um, Heminder, um, anything to add? I, I know you've advised a lot of startups, um, um, you know, uh, uh, and, and done a lot of those startups as well. Any, any thoughts on, on, on what this, on what startups should look out for or should be aware of um, as they step and talk to investors? I think I should look at what Mangala's uh, 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 link, what he sent, I think. I should then ask for some percentage, the amount of startup that I advise. So, no, no, I just jokes aside, I think uh, what you have to really look at uh, if you are a startup founder, uh, I think all of you suggested is based on your, uh, you know, phase of the startup. So, and it shouldn't be like a one-time thing just because some investor or, or rather somebody promised for advisory, you shouldn't give a big chunk of what you, what you start up. I mean, it should start as uh, Mangala said, maybe 1%. Maybe look at like vested uh, a model. So basically, depending on the years, or maybe, I don't know, uh, you bring uh, two or three new business. So I don't know, depending on your agreement, or maybe you help me to get the first investment at that level, maybe there's a, so there should be like a pre-planned model. Of course, if you really feel like, you know, that this person is really, you know, the person that I'm really looking at has vast amount of experience, maybe you can start with one to 2% or a small percentage, uh, and then build on that depending on uh, sort of like a milestone basis. Okay, a, a big. This is for only for advisory only, not for you know hard cash upfront. Yeah, a, a big um, ethical nuance here, right? If if an advisor says, okay, um, give me you know three percent of your company, I will ensure that your your stock gets funded. Um, that's very attractive for a startup, but is that ethically right to do, or or um, you know, I, 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 I'll leave it to the panel. I believe it's not so. Ethical um, for the investor, or ethical for, for the founder to give it straight away. I mean, the investor. I'm just saying ethically in general for, for everyone, like <laughs> for both parties, uh, I, I would say, right? Um, um, my, my, my gut feeling would be like, okay, that's probably something that's not very ethical. Um, um, simply because you're that that party is playing gatekeeper to funding. Um, it, 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 it seems it seems like something that's not ethical, but um, I'll leave it to the panel to kind of maybe maybe I'm wrong here. Um, um, some thoughts and, and, and the things around that. Guys. So I, I would say it's, uh, uh, it's to start off, I think uh, uh, it's all depends on how early, for example, if it is a very early stage, that person could have been one of the co-founders as well. So, so it's depend entirely on the on the level of uh, you know the phase. That for example, that you have just a concept stage, and then there's a like an advisory role. Someone come in saying that I will help you in developing the idea to conceptualize to <clears throat> bring the market to all that. It's you can go for higher percentage because he 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 although he's a advisor he might become like a co-founder also. So it's all depends on where exactly now, but if you already done the legwork, uh, coming up with the idea, the prototype, everything. So then it's, uh, I mean, advisory could be really helpful, but still uh, I think you have to start uh, somewhere around that. Uh, I think what Mangala mentioned, one to 2% maximum at that level. That, that brings up a good point. What is the difference between a co-founder and an advisor? Because I think startups sometimes don't, you know, get that that nuance, um, and you want to be very um, when you when you ha when you start a discussion with with a startup, you want to know where on that fence you stand. Are you a co-founder, or are you a fellow startup? And uh, sorry, are you a, uh, an advisor to that startup? Um, so um, how how do you guys uh, you know? Um, keep that line drawn of where a startup uh, or, or where a co where you enter a co-founder role or, or where you are pure advisory? So this is how I did at uh, Mora Ventures. So Mora Ventures, I essentially, when I started uh, Mora Tour, I invited people to come as advisors. 
but then one of the key thing that I mentioned was initially it's it's a advisory role that you support the startup like an advisor two hours a week or one hour a week or two hours a month whatever but then you can choose whether you can be a part of a like a co-founder or maybe like an investor it depends on whether you give money or whether it's just advisory role but how I wanted to entice people to come and speak to University of Morocco startups was so you come as advisor because most of the people came just you know without even looking at anything from the startup but some of them I know a few people they turned out later as uh, I mean part of the equity team uh, some actually just for the advisor role some some came uh, even uh, connected with various people and they 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 invested their own money as well so I think uh, it's uh, is depending on uh, I can't give you a, exactly maybe uh, the but Mangala's model uh, founders institute must be telling you know hard and fast rule but here it's all the level of in, involvement uh, and of course the moment you put in money it's 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 uh, it's an investor's role and and if you are really part of the work doing uh, operational work as well to a certain extent uh, depending on what is operation at this stage uh, you're part of the team it's no longer advisor. Uh, Anakli, let me come to you because I, I know um, you being kind of part of corporate life, you know, the, the, the lines are very clear. Um, any thoughts on, on, on where, you know, lines should be drawn, I suppose? Going back to your question on the, on the ethical side of this, right? Um, I think what you're saying is the preference you feel is that if someone's going to go out and let's say raise funding and say to you, you know, we're coming in and we're going to raise funding for you, then they obviously want a compensation for that, right? So is the compensation going to come through a deduction from what you raise? So like a percentage of that, right? I mean, typically in the sort of investment banking world, that's kind of what you do, right? You will charge a certain fee, either a fixed sum or a percentage, and it's very clean cut. You don't, you know, um, but saying that, and then the, in, and the investment side is different then. If you choose to then put money or you have proprietary books where you put money into certain startups, that's a completely different ball game, right? Yeah. Um, but from a more loose advisory perspective, especially if you're working as sort of mentors and uh, more freelance, you know, it, it, then I can see where people come to you and say, well, I will do this, but my fee, at least partially, I would like equity, right? Um, so I think the, the, the care there needs to be that, you know, the, at the end of the day, the founders obviously should have a say in who is going to come into their company, right? That what is the value add there? And whoever's raising, you know, whoever's helping you to be that gatekeeper understands and is on the same page as you, right? That they're not just raising money for the sake of raising money, that their, their compensation comes with a little bit more than just, thank you for getting me that check, we're done, right? Um, I think one of, somebody's asked a really interesting question also here, that one is getting people in how do you then extract people if the relationship doesn't work? So in that sense, you know, if an advisor is not, doesn't have that equity and you've compensated them in a monetary way, that's also a cleaner role in terms of relationship, right? Um, but, you know, as Heminda was saying that it's, it depends on where this role goes and how people could jump from being, let's say initially an advisor and ends up becoming a co-founder. You know, I've seen that happen with companies where someone's come in and they came in as an advisor initially and basically became day-to-day -day hands-on operational to the point of becoming a co-founder. So that it, it is, it's more fluid even. And, and for me, I think there's one of the things that's it's very different from when you work with much more mature companies to when you're at this end of the scale, that it is flexible. And that's why I, I see where you're coming from in terms of uh, sometimes these ethical lines are also blurred um, because things are quite fluid at this early stage, right? So, yeah. Angela, any, any thoughts before we move on? Please? Yeah, I think, I mean, when, when a startup comes and say, you know, they want to raise fund, so it's, uh, are the investment ready? 
so uh, typically what happens is these uh, advisors they just don't take a startup and link up with the investor and deals done no it's not that way so you're gonna have to get the startup ready for investment ready so there's a, a sort of a a journey that this advisor has to go with the startup so that's uh, very fair to ask for uh, something in return so when the investment bankers do it they ask for percentage of the uh, the check uh, so advisor might ask a percentage of the equity so they are enticed to get the best deal and then they are working with the founder to make the make the founder investor ready so I think in that sense it's fine, but if it's just a wheeler dealing, okay, I'll connect you here, there, and kind of like just overnight connection, that's that's just different, right? Um, typically, what happens is it's a lot more than just overnight connection. It's just getting the founders, getting their uh, them, you know, and it, preparing them for that investor. Uh, so that deserves uh, uh, some sort of a upside. Okay. Um... Let me next ask a question. I think that was kind of answered by Anakwe, but um, sometimes you make, startups make wrong decisions in advisors, right? Uh, I think initially when you meet an advisor, there's a very rosy picture. They're gonna, maybe you, you get the feeling they're gonna spend a lot of time with you. They really value your startup. Um, you give them, say, uh, you know, you don't give them 15%, but say you give them 3%, um, but, at, at, at a later stage, they don't really add value. Um, uh, <laughs> I guess his question comes about how do you get rid of a bad advisor once you made the decision? And I, I'm not really sure myself if, if there is a way to get rid of a bad advisor. Um, but, and, and um, I, I guess the question would be more, how do you manage the relationship or, or how do you try and, as an ugly said, extract value from the advisor um, as much as possible once you've made that decision to give them equity, which is one of the reasons why, guys, we spoke about even if you're giving, say, 3%, you're giving it over a period of time, um, and it's kind of based on, um, you know, um, vesting, or you can also base it on performance, um, which is, which is you know, we spoke about if, if they're going to get you two clients or something like that, you can be like, okay, at least get me two clients by, by, by some that, and all this is covered in a shallow agreement, but yeah, um, any thoughts on that, guys? Uh, again, uh, just because I mentioned the Founder Institute, uh, that's, it. that's just, uh, it answers all that. So it's really, I'm going to just repeat what it says. Can, can, uh, you what it, the, can you please put the link in here so everyone can yeah, see it? Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. We, we want to see that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll do that after. Uh, to uh, speaking, um, so basically, what it says is, uh, first three months there's a cliff. Uh, advisor doesn't get anything, uh, and then it's monthly vesting. Uh, so if you really, you can vet the advisor within first three months. If they're not really good, you can just uh, cut them loose, and you don't lose anything. And then afterwards, uh, the, the, they earn uh, equity. But if it is one person divided into twenty-four. Uh, so three months they earn the past three months, and then uh, monthly they invest uh, rest of the equity. Uh, that's what the the, the template says. So just okay. Okay. Um, any other thoughts? Uh, I think uh, it's important yeah. that people, you know, realize that it seems at an early stage that equity is kind of is cheap. In a sense, I I, I just wonder, you know, especially when you say one two percent people think, oh, that's great. I don't have to do this cash outflow. I can just, you know, pay them in equity, right? And, and I think the important thing to remember there is that's all well and good as long as you know who's coming in and, you, and it all goes well, right? It's just when things go south that you realize, oh my goodness, now I have somebody on board and I don't really want these people on board, right? Um, and that's when, you know, you have these challenges. So I think as Mangala says, it's really important that you know who it is and that you have this time period to be able to evaluate them and then the stock vests, right? So you have a period of time in which to realize, are they 
what they say they are? Are they going to deliver what they're saying? And, and you know, it's important so for founders also to have those benchmarks, right? This is what they said they're going to deliver, and I'm going to monitor them on that. Um, and then call them out, right? If, if things are not happening and you do it early and you've got to have those difficult conversations relatively early on, um, if there are challenges, rather than waiting for things to just get to the point of frustration. And then it's, you know, it, it's a much harder uh, extraction in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it definitely shouldn't be, oh, we'll just pay you this without meeting certain milestones and criteria. That really needs to be laid out early on so that everyone understands what the expectations are. Okay. Um, let me ask about if, um, you know, I think we covered, uh, you know, most of what you said. So I think the question um, on the chat is, I, I feel the startup has already has somebody vested in or given shares. Um, how do they manage that relationship now if that person a, uh, you know, is not really doing the things that they promised or is not really, you know, the great advisor uh, that, that, that they, that, that, you know, the startup hoped they would be. Um, how would we advise them to manage that relationship uh, going in? Any, any takers, anybody? I'm gonna pick on someone, uh, maybe Hamilton. So I think it's uh, uh, you're in a really bad situation if it is uh, like a big stake that already given to somebody you think it's a bad advisor or a bad uh, shareholder. Uh, but there are things that you can do. For example, it's uh, uh, obviously you should have the, uh, you know, there's uh, two things. One is the, uh, the stake, the, amount, the percentage of stake. The other thing is the, I mean, if you have done the proper shareholder agreement uh, well, what sort of uh, voting rights you have. So if everything is there, then I think there's some legal way out. But other than that, I think it's uh, obviously, uh, it's about, uh, <clears throat> I mean, initially it's a sort of negotiation set, uh, how, how good you are in negotiation and getting him down, or maybe make him, you know, agree that, you know, there's very lim limited uh, support or that you have already giving into this, so it's a, it's a basically <clears throat> it's a it's a negotiation that you have to do. I think that's the best best way rather than giving into uh, into litigation or looking at uh, li 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 that kind of uh, actions. So uh, there are things that you can do. I mean, if it is the last uh, point of no return, there are so many things. But I don't know whether you, we should advise at this scale. But there are yeah. a lot of things we can do. <laughs> I, I I don't think we should advise litigation yeah. because I don't think. You can litigate because you voluntarily assign shares of your company to this person, right? So I don't think yeah. you can litigate, but I think um, maybe um, I, I think usually there is an expectation difference, right, of what uh, that person expects and what and, and what you expected of that person. So I would advise to try and engage um, as politely and then obviously maybe a bit more sternly on um, these were the expectations that they set before you give them stake, you know, have it in writing, um, you know, uh, you should have it in writing. If you don't have it in writing, then try and put it down in writing and say, this is what your expectations are and, um, and let him come back or let him and her come back and say, you know, this is not what I was hoping to do. This was, I thought it was going to be more like this. And then you know that's the best you can you can do, and and, and try and come to some kind of reasonable agreement. So, so I hope um, with that we answer uh, Leafs Leaf even Olson's question to the panelists. Guys, please please ask more panelists because this you know having a panel like this is is it's very difficult to get. And I think with experience, the combined experience of of the panel here, um, I'm pretty sure that you can extract value. Um, and 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 with, and they're doing it for free, so uh, <laughs> you guys should use it as much as possible. Um, no equity asked. <laughs> I I just want to uh, um, uh, you know go into we spoke about advisory role without people spending time. Now let's go into advisory role if the person 
uh, or if that person is making the move into actually spending time in the business uh, where they're actually playing a bit more than advisory, but um, um, I would say managerial or, you know, um, helping open doors, uh, you know, um, recommend uh, contacts, close contacts, make sales. Um, um, uh, uh, so I'll go to Mangala first because he seems to have the magic wand on this uh, with, with, uh, with FICO. <laughs> um, uh, what, what is, uh, is there any recommendations on, on that? If someone gets, if an advisor was to actually open doors, close business for you, um, you know, make, um, make valuable kind of business propositions and stuff like that. Um, um, and spending a lot more active role with number of hours, you know, et cetera, um, going in. I mean, I, I think that uh, in the, the third category I mentioned, expert uh, advice includes opening doors. So that uh, really, it doesn't include closing a deal. So that's where the, 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 the difference is. So actual, once the, let's say, once the introduction or the door is open, it's the founder or the startup's responsibility to close it and then deliver. Um, so I don't think uh, just advice is responsible, just advice is responsible to do that uh, the calls or uh, joining the sales responsibility, taking sales responsibilities or uh, delivery responsibilities, then you are actually joining the team. If you take that kind of role, then you're part of the team. Yeah. So then it's uh, like you guys suggested, you know, it's a different negotiation, a different compensation uh depending on the startup and depending on the situation um but uh, i think uh, the advisors end of the day once you take the equity they go uh the advisors ha have a vested interest seeing you successful as a startup so um the opening doors are part of part and parcel of the deal i believe in my view uh, as long as the the, the 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 founders are capable of closing it, it's, it's all good. So the, the the other things you guys discussed, I think um, also uh, the founders should do their uh, the homework before selecting the advisor. So you don't have to worry about uh, all the other things later. If you select a real gentle uh, men or gentle women, uh, you know, they if they don't deliver value, they also realize it and they'll even wanna, you know, say, I don't deserve this if they don't deliver. So that's the kind of uh, people you want on your advisory panel uh, who really uh, professional about it. And if they deliver value, they'll take the, um, the rightly uh, deserving equity. Otherwise, they should also say, I don't want free stuff. So uh, there are people like that. So th that's the kind of advisors uh, you guys, I mean, the startup should look for. Um, and um, I mean, the homework should be done beforehand. Okay, that, that's good. That, that's a clear, clear line. Opening contacts is one thing, but actually, then closing um, and, uh, and closing them with you is is then there's a different level of understanding. And also, if they're investing, then there's a whole different level of, level of understanding, right? Um, um, yeah. Is it is it uh, you know um, is, is there a rule or a rule of thumb for um, people who do put in money and uh, obviously, um, you know, who take who put in money and do take an active role. Uh, is there are there some guidelines around that? You mean you invest and then advise? Yeah, Ad advice um, and and also become active oh okay so i think the moment you invest you become advisor yeah uh, that's kind of given <laughs> uh, in terms of self-interest right yeah unless you take like dumb money uh yeah. i mean that also happens so then in this founder is my normal listen uh, take the advice but take the money um so but now we were asking you invest and then taking active role. Um, that's a 
that, that's, I, I mean, I don't have experience in it. So I never done that. Um, so I've done investing and advising both together and separately. So that's where my experience is. But if you actually do active role as an investor, that's, I don't know how it would be for the uh, founders who didn't invest because then you, uh, it's kind of a tough situation uh, because it's someone's money. And then I do you have to uh, value that investor founders opinion more than the other co-founder i don't know i'm just uh, it's it's any uh, I'm, i would love to hear opinions from the other panelists i don't necessarily have opinion uh, or experience on that okay. uh Nakui, is there any thoughts i mean you sorry jeevan yeah any any thoughts no, i was gonna say that's really interesting that what mangala pointed out that you know do people who have skin in the game uh want or deserve more of a say than the founders um, and are they going to throw the money around as as weight in a sense right like you know hey so I've, I've put money in so my voice should be louder and heard um, personally I, I haven't come across that um, I have come across um, investors who have supported the um, founders, you know, that they'll come in for pitch sessions um, and sort of support them and do things like that. Um, but, um, and they'll open doors as, as we've all spoken about, right? Even if they've, you know, and part of that's part of the role if, if you put money in. But um, that's an interesting dynamic. I haven't seen that where um, the founders again, you know, and, and I would imagine again, that happens more when things start either going terribly wrong or it's growing really, really well and they want it to go even better. <laughs> it's one of the two ends of that spectrum, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I fully agree on what, uh, what Mangala said. Uh, so it's basically if you're an investor, then you become an advisor as well. I mean, that role you have to play. Not uh, We can discuss uh, where the line exactly, uh, I mean, so it's advisory up to what level, but then automatically you have to be, you have to be there because then it's, um, so one of the things I, I generally like uh, in any uh, investor, uh, he has to be, uh, you know, has to have the capacity uh, to bring in some of the knowledge that the co-founder doesn't have. It could be the sales side, it could be uh, linking up with the, the similar like uh, social capital to all that. So I think that that advisory role, he has to play anyway. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you know he has to, he has to become a like a day-to-day -day operational guy. I mean, it all depends on the uh, the interest that the uh, the investor has. So I think um, uh, I have a, again, as Samarkali said, I haven't seen that uh, somebody like a pure investor getting so much of involved in uh, operational activities. But there are instances where certain investors get uh, too much in the decision making. So I think that's maybe we can discuss maybe later. So that's something that we have to. Uh, there's a lot of issues uh, for a lot of startups. Yeah, I, I, I um, my view on this is I think it also depends on where the startup is, right? So there is um, obviously an established startup. The the definitely the scenario of is the investor making too many decisions um, in the process comes into play. But if it's earlier, if the investor really believes in the product and says, okay, I'm gonna be active and invest time uh, and invest money um, could be a good thing because they really believe in the product or you know, um, they really be, they wanna take it on and, and make it successful and ensure its success. Um, so, so it really is a cross section of where the company is, um, the person that's investing and, and um, you know, if they're going to come in and be active, if they're going to help you build the business, um, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. I, I think it's a, it might be a good thing for a startup. Um, but in, unfortunately, in most cases, um, when someone puts money down, the expectation is, uh, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm going to be passive and, and you're going to, you know, deliver results. Um, but, I, but I think there's definitely a scenario where people can put in money and also get active in, in building the business, um, even though it's not, um, it's 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 understood that once you put in money as an investor, it's in your best interest to protect the money that you've invested 
Um, I also believe there's further roles someone can take where they get active in the business as, as well and, and go forward uh, in doing that. So that's, that's yeah. just, uh, yeah. Sorry, Mom, go ahead. Can I just add something to that, uh, Now, uh, I think Amin also mentioned this, like you making decisions for the founder. Is it when the founder wants the investor to make that or not? Because sometimes, in my view, if you want to micromanage a startup, um, you should do it as an investor, they should do it themselves. I mean, uh, the founders are there because like, we don't know as found investors, we don't know everything. If you know everything, you know, and they, it, it, the investors would be funding the right thing all, all the time, right? But there are, the, the founder's job is to do innovative things and, you know, new, new uh, businesses and stuff. So when they do it, sometimes they may have to do uh, unconventional things. So I, I, my personal opinion, uh, there has to be um, advice. And then if you try to run the company for the founder, that's the wrong investor because uh, uh, it's just not what the investor's role is. Uh, you invest in many companies, some are expected to go uh, belly up, uh, not do well, and some will do really well. So, yeah, at the, the end of the day, investors should not expect to recover ev money from every startup. Um, so, with that, I um, mean, it's just micromanaging the founder is not the right uh, style, in my view. I mean, you might have to. Uh, set certain rules, board level, guidance and approvals, all that, that's good. Uh, but you, we got to give the founders ability to run their business the, the way they, it's though, that's why I, I personally believe in building a relationship before investing in a startup. So when a, when a founder comes, uh, we, I, you know, I may talk to them for three months, six months, get involved, engage, advice, advice, not a cent given. And then you have that relationship and then you know this guy you can work with. Number one, uh, the integrity is really important. And that that's where the, the real deal happens. And then you give the money because you know the, you have that relationship with the founder. And that way you don't necessarily have these issues uh, where uh, you, you know, you have a micromanage founders, so then you, you have that sort of wavelength uh, together with the founder. Yeah. I agree fully uh, with what uh, Mangala said. I think it's a, it's like a, like a, like a girlfriend, boyfriend scenario. You don't propose to a girlfriend on the first day that you meet, right? So you have to have like a, like at least two to three months. I don't know. You can define whether three months or four months or one year. You need that uh, bit of period before you propose. Okay. Love, uh, not love at first sight, I take it, Hemingway. <laughs> Anakla, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I wanted to ask what, uh, you know, from the panel, what your thoughts are in terms of, you know, I think we've looked at it a lot in terms of individual investors or advisors, right? What um, do, what's people's experience when you have corporates doing it? Because obviously there's a lot of corporates now in Sri Lanka who are stepping into this space, right? With accelerator programs and looking at this. So I'd just like to get people's um, views and experiences of what they feel, especially in light of, is it more difficult with corporates in terms of the way they operate and do they then feel this need to get far more involved in the day-to-day -day operations or are they just the same? Are they agnostic and they've given you money and they're willing to open doors? I'd, I'd, I'd like to understand that from people's experience. What are they seeing in the market? In, um, I can, can I go first if that's okay? Um, in my experience, corporates are very difficult to, to work with as startups. I've invested maybe two, three that we've invested with the corporate. Um, there's a lack of ownership, uh, to be honest, on the corporate side. and. Um, there's a tendency for the investors who invest with the corporate to believe, hey, they're going to take ownership, um, and and you know we, we tend to leave it to the corporate to maybe work with the startup. But there's a complete like um, how do you say gap between uh, the corporate's expectations and the startup and the speed at which uh, those two entities work together and and and, and stuff like that. So. In my experience, even though if you think it's a it's a done deal, you know the corporate's going to kind of hold their hand, 
through the process and, and make sure that they get clients and stuff like that. Um, I, I don't, um, you know, in my experience, I, I don't think corporates have been great partners to startups. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing that time again, where uh, if they're the only investors, sometimes they do pull, pull their weight, weight as well, where they have clauses such as if we, if, if you don't, um, you know, it, initially it's very like, it, it comes across as, yeah, we're just trying to protect our, our money, our reputation. You know, if, if you don't hit certain targets, we'll take control of the business by, by this and this date. Um, but, you know, and that tends to happen. And, and then this, the founders lose, um, you know, uh, lose, lose their, their business basically. Um, because they don't hit those milestones. So yeah, that's been my experience. Anyone else want to take that? Guys, I think, I, th I think it's also interesting that I, I feel like people who are already in the tech sector, especially, are probably better at this than your larger conglomerate traditional corporates. You know, because they've gone through that process relatively recently and they understand what it's like to grow their business up, right? They've understood the pain points and they've seen this. So in that sense, um, and also they're a lot more agile, I guess. They're not as, as sort of um, restricted in terms of the way they operate, right? And that's kind of the fear, I feel, with when it's, it's larger companies coming in. They have the money and they do have a lot that you can leverage, but you also need something that shelters those startups from that. You know, there has to be a very, dis it has to be very distinct, right? This is this company, don't go to interfere with it in those ways. Don't, don't put all of the restrictions and all your regulations onto them because that's not gonna work at this stage. Um, but definitely do allow them to leverage the platforms that you have and the reach that you have. Um, but I'm assuming it's also a learning curve, right? As people get through this, that they, they, you know, they'll understand better. And, and that's partly, um, you know, why incubators and accelerators exist, and why, like, even Hatch, you know, is, is trying to this thing is um, where we, we we know that there's a space, but they have to be outside of the corporate body. Otherwise, the antibodies of the corporate will eat them up, and and that's what I've seen generally happen. Mangla, Aminda, anything you guys want to add to that? I think, uh, yeah, this corporates, I think you have to be, if you are a co-founder, you have to be extra careful because uh, obviously they have the, the muscle power to everything. Uh, and also, if you look at uh, the current scenario, say uh, this COVID related, you know, there's a lot of issues going on. I mean, so if you look at, uh, uh, there are two strategies. So if you are a startup, having issues these days and, and money is a really this thing. So this is the, if you are a corporate, then this is the time to invest in startups. I mean, if you think it's good. So obviously you might fall into that trap as well. Uh, so, so, so that's because they have the muscle power. Maybe they have extra money to, you know, better runway to resist and all that. So I think, so those are the things we have to be careful. And, uh, and generally uh, I would say it's uh, don't get into the trap of you know you know this whole scenario of organizing hackathons to all that right so there's a something behind that right i mean if you if a corporate doesn't have a lot of ideas the easiest thing is to do a hackathon right so you get the ideas then you don't want to spend anything you just have the event cost only you can just implement that so 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 in my view i don't believe in hackathons so i mean others might have different views uh, so so it's 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 uh, obviously up to the founder to decide, but then you have to think about in that line as well. And but there are very good corporates, I would say, even in Sri Lanka, who really look at uh, you know a startup uh, founder side. But uh, few pointers that the founder has to look at, especially when when looking at uh, corporate uh, investments. I, I just want to add to. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not against hackathons. I think it should happen. And I think the, the, the corporate should go and try and do it themselves. They'll fail miserably and then come back to, 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 to what you know, we tell them. So, so you know, I, I think let them do hackathons, let them try. And I think, um, you know, once they find out how difficult a journey it is, then they will come speak to, to um, you know, incubators, accelerators, all that. And they'll try and understand how exactly to, to build a business, right? 
Um, I have a question from the crowd. Um, his question was, what do you think about a more technical investment role, not just advisory, but also to support with developing the product, maybe by using the investor's own team or company, et cetera? Do you think that makes sense? That's a good opportunity for both the startup and the investor, question mark. If so, what sort of percentage would make sense or what's the best way to calculate that? So I, I think this is very close to that thing of um, how do you value someone's time when they come into a startup? And, and it's, a, it's a good question. And I think we can generalize it, right? Uh, what if you have a CTO of a really big business who's getting paid you know, quite well um, coming into a startup, um, but just offering his technical skills um, instead of, um, you know, um, uh, I guess, investment? Um, how would you how would you guys advise on that kind of uh, that kind of thing? And it's not only CTOs; it could be salespeople, it could be you know um, uh, people with corporate experience. Um, how how would we how would we advise startups to think about giving them equity, guys? I think it's essentially like you getting a CTO as a co-founder, right? Uh, something like that, right? If you name it in a different way. So obviously, I think you have to give a certain portion. It can go even up to 20%, even, I mean, if it is, uh, uh, you know, say five to 20%, depending on the role that you play. If it is like a, uh, it's not just one-off. I don't believe in just, uh, uh, you know, you build one-off and you give it like a handover because there's, there'll be a lot of developments that you have to do. So it's a role that, it's a never-ending role. It's, if it is it a, should be, it should be Westing, too, right? Kind of yeah. Like, should, be West, should it be Westing? Like, should it be Westing? Over, yeah. like if you do, obviously, it's, yes, it's, yeah, you can you can look at uh, like a vesting model, and uh, I, I mean, even though it's not really startup model, but uh, at Slintech, we do that. For example, Slintech um, in Nanotechnology Institute, we do uh, one of our model of uh, you know uh, commercialization is basically we give some of our products, uh, so technical know how uh, for another startup or a company to take it as uh, so we are the technical partner. And the joint venture, we go from 5% to 20% to depending on sometimes even up to a bit more than that. Uh, so that model has worked uh, a few times. Uh, so I think, uh, so that's a model, I mean, it's a different way, but it's a similar model. So we become the technology partner or, a, or the organization or the partner who does the technology part. And it's an ongoing thing. Yeah, um, yeah sorry, I was gonna say a big sacrifice guys, guy coming from a corporate side, getting paid a million, whatever rupees a month, comes into a corporate, um, we need to obviously reimburse him. Um, Mangla, what, what, what would you do? Yeah, so I was just gonna say, I mean, we've done at, at Calci, what I mean, we've literally done this with tech teams, um, product development, actual product development as investment. Um, so that when we do that, it's actually what we value the 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 our time, team's time and then uh, we value the startup uh, we've done it in uh, sri lanka we've done it for startups in new york and london so uh, i've done multiple times uh, where we invested our uh, tech team time where we in software engineering time itself we developed the product so all we've done is that we value the scope we take we do a scope and then we value the the team's time, uh, and then you know it's it's just a instead of dollar investment, it's that uh, investment gets uh, in return we get the equity uh, when the product is delivered. Uh, sort of uh, that that we've done a couple many times. Anagli, any thoughts? Um, let, let me let me put it in a more interesting way. Anagli, if you if a startup came to you and was really, and, and you were interested in the startup, um, but obviously you value your time. Um, how would you want to engage the startup and, and you know, say you were going to be their CFO or um, their listing advisor, what would you look at and how would you, how would you want to be compensated in terms of equity? So, um, I'm a real sucker. I, I do a lot of this stuff for free. So <laughs> right? I've not built a business model. Me too. Me too. <laughs> I'm realizing now that I've really shortchanged myself. Um, so I think, uh, you know, as you said, one is you, you're obviously looking at the founders 
right? The business model, whether that clicks and you're really engaged by it, and then the founders, um, and are they going to give as much as you, right? And it becomes attractive as long as you realize that, you know, you're giving up something in the short term for a gain in the longer term, right? And you have to be able to accept that trade-off, right? If you've got a lot of you know, costs that you have to handle today, that doesn't work for you, right? That trade-off really doesn't work. So you've got to be willing to take the haircut in terms of um, what you're going to miss out on, on in terms of your compensation. But you know that in the longer term, that's going to come back in spades, right? Um, and, or, but it's a risk. So you have to be somebody who's willing to take a risk because it could also all disappear in a year and a half. It could all just go away. Um, so I would say to anybody who's going down the role, you know, you, if, especially if you're going to play a large role in this, you have got to be somebody who is um, financially uh, relatively secure in where you are so that you are not risking things to a stage that you, you know, you're, you're going to be in a position or that you're in a position where you know that even if it goes horribly wrong, I can just go back to a job. It's easy enough for me to do that, right? Um, that you have that comfort level. But I do think that to put yourself in that position, it's a mindset thing. You really have to be somebody who is entrepreneurial and willing to take that risk because I see people wanting to come on board, but also still want their compensation in full and that's when it's not possible for startups right you can't get paid the million rupees a month plus get you know the shares and all of that that's just not a realistic assumption for you you know um until this becomes you know unicorn then maybe you can come into it at that point and ask for a comp um but i think in personally if what makes it attractive or what would make it attractive is the opportunity Right, that someone's presenting that that they found um, whatever the pain point is and the solution that they're bringing to the market, and then for me it really is clicking with the, the founders, right, the entrepreneurs. That that and it's the same if I'm investing money, it the knowing that that person is uh, so driven and wants to create that solution, right. Yeah, and is passionate about it. I, I think those things really drive it, that that would be what's attractive about it because you also then know you're on the same page that you're gonna give everything to it. That's what would be attractive to give up the compensation and move. Um, it also, it, it, it depends on which stage of your life you're at and are you ready to do that jump? You know, it's not easy for everybody. Um, and I, I mean, I know that I've, I've seen these cycles now, right? You know, in my early 20s where everybody jumped out of everything that they were in and went into startups. And that was the initial boom, you know, and there was so, so very few companies that survived that initial boom, but everybody left management consultancy and investment banking to go do this. And some people made a lot of money out of it. And it was great. And I think that that cycle, especially for people who are younger and willing to take those risks as well, it's great. For those who have experience, even better. I think the days of value add. I know that everything is about who's under 40 and who's doing this, but I think even us, all of us who are above 40 do have some value add. So if they're willing to take that risk, um, I think it is a, it is a great opportunity. Um, but yeah, that, that's how I would see it. Heminder, I, I know you, you've been a person that takes multiple risks. If a startup was to approach you today, um, uh, and your story is a life of kind of, you know, giving it a go. Uh, what, what would you need for them to give, you know, um, if that, if the start is attractive, what would you need for them to, to get you uh, hooked? Uh, I think, uh, obviously, if the people who have uh, already got the investment, they know the story, but this is like the real uh, first timers. I think uh, I would say no investor would invest in just an idea or your business plan or, or how attractive your slide deck is. Right? I don't think any investor would invest in that. All the successful uh, investment in startups to whatever, it's basically uh, the, what investor really looking into is uh, who you are or the team behind it. So I think that's the number one. Of course, the other things matter as well, maybe later on. But the number one hook I would prefer is if 
that person if uh, if he can show who you are uh, in terms of your integrity i mean of course these things you can cannot tell uh, in in maybe 20 second 30 seconds uh, you know sort of pitch but even in that 20 second 30 seconds what you have to show is that you know maybe who you are more than going into your product to all that so i think the other things is of course you buy the time from the person and then you slowly get into uh, you know more time to describe the other things your product to your magic sauce to your everything so i think it's essentially you have to showcase that who you are i think that's what uh, really uh, bring that hook uh, initially thanks that's, that's a great um, segue into the question imanti pereira asked how do you sink a hook into an investor so um, i think you know i would say um, sometimes um, you know it is about what you represent and what you can do so the investor is taking a risk on the entrepreneur is the most important thing as him and said is the entrepreneur um, but i think you know sometimes for investors uh, you know especially to entrepreneurs here it shows it, it's good if you show them a moving train most investors want to jump on a moving train <laughs> rather than a train that's that's stuck in the station um, so i would say traction is another thing that would if you're able to show traction in whatever you're doing, um, I think would, that would be another good thing, um, you know, to get investors to, to look at a startup. Uh, Anakli? So, I think another thing that I've noticed, you know, when we've um, gone through a lot of uh, sort of rounds with, in, in, uh, with entrepreneurs, right, is it's important that people are on top of their numbers that they understand and they can tell you what's going on with their companies. Um, you know, obviously if you're a pure startup and you're just at the idea stage, it's a little bit different, but even then you want people who understand what is required, right? And I've noticed some of the questions that come at them, you know, the, the entrepreneur that stands out is the one who really can answer those questions, gets it, right? They're not sort of, um, they're not one step removed from their total business, right? The team really has to be on top of this and be able to portray that. Um, but uh, I, I do think that, you know, as you say, traction is important. Uh, somebody who's running, who is really engaged and is driven, um, but also someone who is flexible as an entrepreneur, right? You, you, you want them obviously to be single-minded in where they want to go, but someone who can take advice and pivot and you, you, you can see that. I, I find that um, a lot of investors make these decisions in a relatively short time, right? You know, you kind of think, wow, a five minute pitch, how can you ever get this, right? But uh, that's kind of the time frame that a lot of investors decide on, you know, that five, 10 minutes initially when they meet you, the team, and they make a decision in many ways on who you are and how they connect with you. Um, it's not always fair because you could be having an off day. It could be, you know, you might not present yourself in the strongest way. Um, but there is that level of, wow, this person, I, I get where they're going. And, and I, and I, um, and there's a level of trust as well that you, that you, that it's not just a front, right? That there is, someone genuine behind that and behind, you know, that's important as, as him said, integrity is important as well for investors. Um, before Mangla answers, last round of questions, guys. So please put up your questions. Mangla? Yeah, I, I think I agree with all of you. I mean, it, it's the hook is not it, like one thing. It's, it's first, how do you demonstrate your integrity the startup quality, the product quality, or your quality, your passion, and the commitment. So you need to get all those across to your investor. Um, so that's why I said you need to build that relationship. Uh, so that's where you get to communicate or demonstrate that. And then, of course, uh, the, the market opportunity matters to the investor. Uh, so that's where they would look at the your action plan for traction and things like that. Um, after all, then then comes the uh, appropriate valuations and the terms uh, to get the investment. So a lot of founders, what they think is immediately this valuation and the terms and okay, this blah blah. No, it's it's just that all the uh, all of that about things I mentioned is a lot more important to get that hook. 
Um, so that's and, and and also when you meet the investor, you need to make sure that you've done your homework. I mean, you need to know uh, the answers to basic questions that they can ask, like how much you're raising, uh, how long will that funds gonna last, and the burn rates and the financial projections, things like that. And you know they're gonna. Uh, so if you prepare for specific question, then they're gonna ask certain follow-up questions. Like assumptions when you make the predictions, you have to be uh, ready to answer those. Um, and then, you know, uh, some other, I mean, I'm thinking globally, if you talk to global investors also, then you need to understand, uh, um, you know, your unit economics and, you know, uh, all that stuff. Because if you don't know your unit economics and go try to raise money, um, you might look like a, sort of a, uh, I don't know, be, uh, the, I, I, for me to invest in a founder, they need to know their home. They need to have that, done their homework. So that's kind of uh, how you get the investor on the hook. Then the investor feels comfortable. Okay, this founder is a gem that's worth investing. So I, the investor's goal is to, t you know, in, uh, grow their money. How do they grow their money? Investing in the uh, founder that who could do that. So that's uh, that's how you uh, get the investors hooked. Okay. Uh, thanks, guys. I think we're you know I think we're over time anyway. Um, I, I just want to maybe ask you one last question and then we'll we'll kind of uh, finish. There's no no other questions from the crowd. Um, so I'll ask you. Uh, we wanted this conversation to be very much around you know whether it's the right approach around ethics and values and stuff like that. And if I can ask each panelist to kind of dig into their past and, and look at, say, one value um, that really got them to where they were, or, or a set of that. It can be, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, you know, cadence to go through a set of values. Um, what would that be? And, um, you know, what, what do you think got people to believe in you and, and your companies? And, and, and what you do as a person and, and so um, maybe we can start with him and come down back to Anakali. So uh, I've been in both sides. So I've been a sort of investor as well, like a small time investor, as well as I've been on the other side, I was getting investment as well. So I think uh, if I put both uh, sort of types of experience into one, uh, what really helped me uh, in, in the past was actually, uh, 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 number one was actually I had some past experience to show, uh, at least in one area, may not be like running a startup, but at least to show, uh, you know, something that I did maybe as a, like a, like a corporate executive. So I think uh, this is where the trick is for if you are a really young uh, person, say university or maybe with no past experience. Uh, so I think that really worked for me. Uh, but the second one, I think, uh, uh, that really worked was the, the sort of connection that I had. So basically, whom I knew in, in similar areas. So I think, uh, so basically, if anyone uh, wants to invest, maybe he might ask at least a couple of people whether you know this guy, whether you know the background of this person. So I think those goes a long way. So I think, uh, I mean, Sri Lanka is a small country. You speak to one person. You can always connect to so many other people. I think so. So this social network uh, is a very important one. Uh, experience and I mean your past experience plus uh, your, you know, the social network is I think the number one uh, if you really want to get started with. Yeah. Well, well. I was on mute. Um, so I think uh, for me. Uh, I mean, I, uh, my obsession to keep my word. Um, so I think that's just helped me so much because it made me reliable to those who, uh, when I give the word, because I, will, I, I, I kind of don't want to go back on my word. So, I, so that's kind of, uh, you know, when people get to know you and then uh, they start doing business with you for decades and then they trust you. 
uh, no amount of uh, undercutting or other ways uh, can um, break your business because people would rather work with people they trust. I think uh, that's really important for me and for my, you know, people I work with. And uh, I mean, that's, I value that so much too. Yep, I hear that. Anakali? Um, so I think integrity, um, that, you know, as Margot said that, you know, people's ability to trust you. And uh, I think that's very key. Um, hard work that they know that, you know, uh, you will do what you say, you commit to it, and you will move everything to get, you know, to, to achieve that deliverable. Um, and the other one is, I think, taking ownership, right? Whether if whatever goes wrong, even at the end of the day, the buck stops with you and you have to take ownership of things. You have to take ownership of it at every single level, whichever level you're at. Um, that's important that, you know, uh, you take the responsibility. Um, and I think those things have been key in terms of uh, whether it's being hired by somebody to uh, into a job that I a role that I went into, or getting clients on board. Yep, um, I, I would actually you know even for me I think it comes my uh, grandfather who was a big inspiration to me and uh, one of the things that has always been drilled into me that word is bond right and um, you have to like if, especially if um, if you're trying to be a leader and get other people to believe in your company, et cetera, you have to be able to deliver what you say, what, what you know, you deliver. And it, it, even, even if times are really tough, you just got to be open, honest, transparent, and uh, just try to keep, you know, delivering and, and doing good. And I think um, that's been, uh, you know, something that's kind of worked for me. And, and maybe that's advice for, for other entrepreneurs. I have, I think we're come to end of time. So I have immense respect and you know um i really love this panel and i could actually go on talking for another half an hour um but uh you know i i think i really like to thank the panelists for taking their time and uh you know with us and sharing um all these questions that we had as startups and even myself i learned a lot from today's conversation and i think um if we can all just agree not to pass judgment. And I think, you know, things take time to learn, you know, um, the startup ecosystem in Sri Lanka is, is developing as we build. And I think, you know, we just have to learn as we grow. And I, and I, and I believe, um, you know, uh, together we can do that. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to working with all of you and making sure Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan ecosystem goes to the next level. Thank you guys. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Anna. Thanks. Bye. See you guys. Bye.